All right, well, welcome uh, everyone to those of you in the room and those of you joining us um, virtually. Delighted to have Dr. Lulu Shi with us today. Um, uh, Dr. Shi joined us only a couple of months ago um, and uh, we're really excited to have her here. Her research spans technology, education, work and employment in organizations. And she works on the project Domestic AI um, as a postdoctoral research fellow. Um, so uh, looking forward to hearing about uh, some of your work today, uh, in particular, this uh, exciting topic, the future of unpaid work. So uh, without further ado, I'll hand over to you. Great, thank you so thank much, you. Mark. All right, then um, I will start the presentation. Um, as Mark has mentioned, I am working at OAI and I'm a postdoctoral researcher here, um, and my background is sociology. And this is a paper that I'm currently working on, which I'm presenting today. And the data collected is from um, the project that I'm working on called Domestic AI, which is led by Professor Ekaterina Hertog and team members are Professor Vili Letonvieta and myself. So now let's get into this. Um, okay. So today's structure basically has three parts. Um, first, I just want to emphasize why understanding unpaid work is also important, because most of the research that has been done so far is really concentrating on um, the future of paid work. That is automation processes in paid work, such as um, whether workers will become abundant uh, become unemployed due to technology, um, but uh, the unpaid work part has really been uh, ignored. So today I want to emphasize why unpaid work is important. And then we'll go into the second part uh, and we uh, just briefly compare paid and unpaid work. And uh, the goal of this part is to see whether we can borrow understandings that is gained from uh, labor market research and borrow that to understand future of unpaid work. And in the end, I want to present some findings that we have um, done with the team, with the domestic AI team, where we have conducted a forecast exercise with technology expert to understand the future of unpaid work. All right, so much to the structure. Um, okay, so as mentioned before, uh, main research that has been conducted on the future of work is really on paid work. And um, of course, understanding the future of paid work is very important um, because we know that with technological innovations, some uh, work can be, can be automated, some tasks can be done by machines um, and replace human labor, right? And that has direct social impact and economic impact. Um, and what researchers have done is basically they uh, wanted to find out that whether um, there's a difference between different sort of jobs, whether some jobs may be easier to automate than other jobs. And what they did is uh, they basically mapped out the task makeup of different jobs and to uh, understand what kind of task or what kind of skills are more easy and more difficult to automate. So what you see here on, on this uh, figure is um, researchers here have uh, typologized task into four categories. Mainly you have the routine versus non-routine, non-routine versus routine ones, and the cognitive versus the manual ones. And this shows that the both non-routine, whether it's non-routine cognitive or non-routine manual, they are the most difficult to automate. And then you got the routine jobs, which is more uh, easy to automate. So that means uh, work that involves a lot of routine jobs um, is more likely to be automated in the near future. And other researchers more recently um, uh, followed a different approach. They uh, basically just followed a different type of uh, typologization of task. So Fred and Osborne, and they're both researchers here at Oxford University as well, they found that jobs that involve um, high amount of social intelligence and creativity are the ones that are most difficult to automate. And what they did is they um, computed automation scores for jobs and for tasks. So for each job or for each task, they had an automation score, let's say 50% uh, of job X and Y can be automated. So that's what they did. Um, but then it really raises a question, what about 
um, the categorization paid versus unpaid work? Can we simply use the insights that we have gained here from labor market research and apply, let's say, the automation scores to understand how much of unpaid work can be automated in the near future? So basically, the question is whether there's one uh, future of work. So how are we gonna do this? First, um, I just want to highlight why looking at unpaid work is important. And I'm gonna do that in three points. First of all, we know from time use data that we spend a lot of time on doing unpaid work. Um, it is, so this is the total amount of time that we spend working and about half of the time we actually spend on doing unpaid work. So it's substantial. So just from a time resource perspective, understanding how technology can automate work um, is quite uh, relevant for our daily life at the individual level. But then also on the societal level, it's important to understand this because we know that unpaid work is distributed not equally across the society. So we know that women do more uh, unpaid work. We know that people of color do more unpaid work. And we know that um, women's work, uh, basically all kind of feminized work are devalued and uh, sometimes also dismissed as unproductive. Um, and we also know that white women have been benefiting from free labor that were carried out by um, women in color. So there's a lot of um, also social dynamics going on and understanding how technology can contribute to automate unpaid work also has uh, a social dimension uh, in the sense of its meaning. And lastly, and also very briefly, um, capitalism also depends on domestic work. So um, the home is a place for social reproduction and for maintenance of the worker. So you can see here, for example, workers coming back from the factory, being nourished, the social reproduction going on at home, and this is free work, unpaid work, so that they can go back to work again, um, do their, sell their labor, produce surplus. Um, and this is kind of like the wheel of capitalism. So it's kind of crucial to understand what is going on, not only in that part, but also in that part. Okay, now next, uh, research so far. As mentioned, uh, research really has focused more on uh, the labor market. And this is just a list of recent research that has explored how automation is likely to impact the labor market. Um, I'm not going to go into details of all this research, but basically they say like X or Y percent of jobs can be automated in the near future. Um, and this is again for an offspring study that I uh, showed you uh, previously in this figure. This is um, the study where they have done the automation scores for tasks and for jobs. And the reason why I mentioned this is that there is one paper that, to my knowledge, actually looks at unpaid work. And this is carried out by team members of, in, in our team. So Professor Ekaterina Hertog, she um, led this paper. And basically what this paper did is they borrowed automation score from labor market research and derived automation scores for unpaid domestic work. And the result that they got 50 to 60% of time spent on doing unpaid work can be automated or is likely to be automated is um, by using results that, or the automation scores that were uh, computed in labor market research. And in my paper, I want to ask the question whether we should actually do this. Can we directly compare paid and unpaid work? Can we directly use automation scores gained from here, apply that to unpaid work? So that's basically the, the question, research question that I have in this paper. And to do so, I think maybe it's useful to compare paid and unpaid work. Uh, what do you see in this table? I have on this side paid work, characteristics of paid work, and here characteristics of unpaid work. Um, and I listed three dimensions that I want to touch upon today in this presentation. So the first one is work organization and infrastructure. So if we think about uh, the workplace, that can be uh, factories, it can be um, warehouse or shops, um, the floors, the walls and the object, they can really be designed for um, 
enabling robots to move around, enable um, machines to operate, and there's also more space for large machines. Um, but if we think about the home on, on that side, so homes are usually, first of all, smaller, and they are unstructured um, or less structured and less standardized. Um, it's also more cluttered. So the home setting is really difficult for um, machines to operate. So it's a really difficult setting for automation to happen. And then um, work division also looks different in um, at workplace and at home. So at a workplace, we have um, in most of cases, we have work division or labor division. Um, it's possible to break down um, task into smaller tasks, that is break down complex tasks into smaller tasks. Um, and those smaller tasks are then easy to standardize, which then can enable automation. On the other hand, in the homes, labor division looks different. So it's usually one person or several person doing one job from the beginning to the end, like one person cooking the entire meal. Um, and that also makes automation more difficult. Now, if we go to the second dimension here, um, culture, values, and norms, and if we think about work, uh, the motivations to, to work, so it can be self-realization, yes, for sure, but we also rely on um, selling our labor in the labor market uh, to have an income. So there, it, there's quite a lot of transaction going on, selling labor and getting income. Um, and in unpaid work, on the other hand, Unpaid work, so work uh, being done at home for free, that's very often seen as an expression of love and care. So imagine you're cooking a meal for a family. It's not just the labor itself that you spend into those activities, but maybe also thinking about, oh, what does my family like to eat? Um, what sort of nutrition do they need? Um, so there's a lot of emotional labor going on, and that also requires social intelligence. And um, it can be argued that emotions and social intelligence is more difficult to automate. Uh, we can also ask the question whether we should automate it at all. Um, so that's the contrast again between paid labor and unpaid labor. And then the third dimension that I want to mention today is uh, the motivations for uh, automation. And here we know from um, uh, economic historians that automation at the workplace is it's very much generalized, but it's um, motivated by three different forces. So we got um, the employers um, who may push automation in order to save labor. So introducing new technology, uh, be more efficient, produce things more cheaply and save labor costs. And we also have the workers who because of the introduction of new machines may need to change their job or even lose their job. So there may be some, um, some motivations against or defending their jobs and against um, automation and technology. And then we have the regulators. They usually aim for social stability. And so they can be for or against automation, depending on um, the specific historical period, depending on the geographical location. So there's a lot of historical contingency going on um, about the forces of those three major interest groups that shape the automation. Um, and on this side, it looks a little bit different. Um, here, moti the motivation to, for automation is mainly pushed by producers who um, sell automation products basically, and to uh, expand their market and uh, products, those automation products are the, co the co commodities in that case. Um, and the goal here is to make profits. And consumers on the other hand are more fragmented, so less well organized, therefore they have less power to push through their interest. Um, and in this case of housework, um, as I've mentioned, it's women do more housework than men. And men or women are also underrepresented in the labor market, uh, especially in engineering sector, in technology sector, women are less presented. Therefore, their interest is also less presented. So there's less interest of women that can push and shape automation um, in, in, in work. 
Now, just to sum up, um, this comparison shows us that there are quite a lot of differences going on when we compare paid and unpaid work. Uh, work is organized differently at the workplace and at home. Uh, we have different infrastructures, different resources. There are different values and norms attached to um, paid and unpaid labor. And there are also different um, interest groups involved that um, push um, automation forward or, or against automation. Okay, but then we can still ask the question, um, is there maybe some connections between paid and unpaid work? Um, if we think about new technology, for example, um, if there's technology available for, for chopping vegetable, let's say, um, can we not use this technology in um, labor market, such as a uh, professional restaurant kitchen, and at the same time also at home in the kitchen? So is there a link that between both if we have um, technology available? Now, to understand this, um, I'm going to uh, see whether there's any connections going on and we are exploring this through the lens of unpaid domestic work because that's that's the um, research question that um, I'm basically raising this paper. So the first point that I want to mention is yes, we can um, buy ready-made goods and we can save labor by doing so. So you can imagine we can, for example, buy ready-made meals um, and we don't have to cook anymore. So that's saving unpaid labor, saving time in doing so. Or we can buy clothes and we can save time uh, knitting our own jumper. Um, so in this case, automation um, enables to produce products cheaply and in mass so that the average consumer can um, buy those goods and save their own labor. So that means that technology allows labor saving in the factories or in the labor market, and also time and labor saving at home. So there's indeed a connection going on. You can say that they go hand in hand. And what about the second point? This is purchase of labor saving machines. Um, with labor-saving machines, I mean machines such as um, laundry or uh, washing machines, I think that's the word in English, um, and, or dishwasher, or fridge, or uh, vacuum cleaners, and all those products can, can help us to save uh, unpaid labor, or save time in doing so. Um, and so the majority of those machines and those products, and actually, all that I just mentioned were produced first for industrial use or for military purposes. And then um, producers, they um, want to expand the market and to make it more available for the average consumer so that they can sell more items. And what they did is they innovated the production process um, to make it cheaper and to make it available for, for the public basically. And Again, in this case, we can say, yes, it somewhat goes hand in hand. If there's technology available, we can use that in both settings. And what about, what about the last point? This is the externalization of tasks to consumers. So here, um, I just want to maybe illustrate this case on, um, on an example uh, that is a furniture industry or furniture production. So if we think about automation, how is it enabled in the factory? Well, first, we have the complex task to produce furnitures. And in order to automate this, we need to break down the complex task into smaller and simple tasks so that they can be standardized and automated. Now, um, what is the easiest to automate? Well. Um, production of single items is pretty easy to standardize and to automate. So if you think about the production of um, a table surface or the production of table legs, so single items are really easy to automate. It's very cheap. Um, but what is more difficult and what is more costly is the assembly part. Um, assembly part, assemble um, different parts together to make it and furniture. Yes, of course you can automate this, but it's more costly. Um, and in order to 
make products cheaper and to have more buyers, what companies, and we all know IKEA, what IKEA did is they basically outsourced the more complex part to the consumers. So they only um, provide or produce the um, table surfaces and table legs. And we as the consumers, we actually take on that labor and we spend our own free time and do our free labor and we assemble the furnitures. Um, so this is a opposite uh, case, I would say. So it's not the same as the first and the second one. Here, um, we can see that technology or advancement in technology or automation does not really mean that we are going to save labor or save time in both places. So this is pretty good for furniture companies, but it actually adds to our um, to unpaid work for the consumers. Um, and I think it's maybe a good example just to highlight it's not really useful to think in technology, uh, technological deterministic terms. We also need to think about um, the social context, uh, social, political, and economic context, such as a business model of um, an organization. And just to maybe complete the story and as a small side note, um, Many consumers, they actually don't enjoy uh, assemble um, IKEA furniture or they don't have the time. So what a lot of consumers do is they pay workers as a gig um, to assemble the furniture. And what happened is actually um, TaskRabbit, which is a gig uh, platform, online platform, was really popular, is very popular for um, customers to post their IKEA jobs on, on that. So then that basically means that they, they still, they pay for that part, just uh, not to IKEA anymore, but to a gig worker. But then what happened in 2017 is that uh, IKEA bought TaskRabbit. Um, so, so they now not only sell the parts, but also make some profit um, for the assembly part. Okay. Okay, now to our study. Um, so what we did in domestic AI is we collected, um, we, we did a forecast exercise. We thought, okay, it's maybe necessary to understand um, unpaid work as such and not borrow insights gained from labor market studies. So what we did is we developed our own automation scores for domestic tasks. And we did this in a Delphi study. Um, I'm not gonna go into the detail, but if anyone's interested here in the room or um, at home uh, or somewhere else um, is interested in methodology, then we can discuss this in the discussion part. Um, but I do want to just show you the uh, our sample. So what we did is we um, recruited technology experts um, to participate in our study, and we asked them to um, help us with forecasting and to compute those automation scores. And those are the experts that we reached out to. Um, this is a collaboration project with UK and Japan. So we have Japanese experts and we have some UK experts. We have female and male experts, and we also invited respondents across different area in academia, R&D and businesses, but they are all people who work, um, who are, have expertise in technology. So they're all tech experts in that way. Um, for this paper though, I only use data from, from here, from the UK sample. And this is because I'm gonna compare uh, our automation scores with the um, automation scores that have been developed in the labor market. And I want to compare this with a UK labor market. So using this basically is I want to have a clean comparison, but in robustness check, I will be using everything to, to see whether the results stay robust. But the goal is really, so, or the hypothesis here is really, if I compare our automation scores to labor market automation scores, if there are differences between those scores, then that's a good indicator to say, okay, there are differences between paid and unpaid work. So, okay, maybe we do actually need specific research on unpaid work. We can't simply borrow insights gained from labor market studies. Um, and this is an example of the survey that we, we showed them. 
Um, so first we describe the task that we ask them to make predictions about. And this is a example for, for cooking. Um, so we describe what is cooking, what kind of things you do. So this involves washing, chopping, and so on. And then we ask them what percentage of the time that, act that currently um, goes into this task can be automated in the next five and then 10 years. And in this paper I'm presenting, I'm going to use a 10 years data. Uh, and they can then choose an answer between zero and 100%. And then we'll also ask a question about uh, cost estimation, but I'm not going to go into that today. Um, this is probably not going to be part of the paper. Okay, so um, the findings. What is important to notice here is that we have two colors. Um, and the dark blue bars, this is our automation scores. So this is developed um, through this Delphi forecast exercise. And we have the light blue bars, which is um, developed uh, in labor market research. And this is, specific, this is done by the ONS, which is the Office of National Statistics here in the UK. Um, and so how to interpret this figure? On the x-axis, we have 15 different tasks that cover all sorts of domestic work that we do. And those categories we derived by using time use uh, data. So we have um, work such as cooking, dishwashing, cleaning um, here in the front. So uh, until here, this is all housework. And as from here, those are care work. So care work include physical child care, teaching child, interacting with child, escorting child, care for adult. Um, and the Y or the vertical axis, um, that means the percentage of time that we can save with uh, future technology. So it ranges from zero to, uh, it goes up to some, something just below 70%. So basically it means um, if we, for example, look at this bar using our automation score uh, for shopping in the next 10 years, about 60, maybe three or something percent of the time is likely to be saved using um, this technology. That, so time that we currently spend on shopping. Um, well, so what's the result? If now we compare the light with the dark blue bars, what, what can we see here? What I think um, is quite obvious is that our automation scores is lower um, for all the tasks than the ONS scores. And this is, so I just labeled the average, the ONS predicts 60% and we predict uh, 39%. Um, so, so it's quite lower than um, ONS score. And um, so with this, I think, we can probably reject the null hypothesis saying that, oh, paid and unpaid work kind of follow the same logic. Um, automation will be uh, very similar. And we can confirm that probably it's necessary to have own automation scores that specifically investigate unpaid work. And why is this different? Well, we have seen that there are different um, political economies going on here um, that shape paid and unpaid work. We have seen that there are different motivations pushed by different interest groups to advance technology. And we have seen um, the setting to, for automation is different. The home setting and the factory setting is different, enable different degree and also types of automation. And we have also seen that paid and unpaid work are attributed with different values and different norms. So what's, what's the take home message? Um, so I don't want to overburden everyone. Um, so there's simply one take home message, which is there is no one future of work. I think that's what we have seen in this presentation. It's important to take account um, the different political economy that paid and unpaid work is embedded in. And therefore, we probably need to investigate unpaid work as such and not borrow insights gained from the labor market. And that's about it. Thank you very much for the attention. And I hope it was um, interesting for the audience as well. Here are the references.
Um, I'm just going to see whether there are any questions from online. Oh, thank you. So there's one question from Andy. I'm just going to read it aloud so that everyone knows um, the question. Do you think that it and it enviable, oh, enviable, that automated and partially automated labor will eventually erase gender differences in unpaid labor of a subset of the population? Um, yeah, I think that's a really good question, Andy. Um, as we have seen, uh, there's a gender dynamic going on, there's gender division in unpaid labor and women do more work um, than men. Um, and so, of course, there's hope that oh, with new technology, we can liberate women. We can um, women can do less unpaid work and can go into the labor market. Um, but I think it's also important to maybe look back into the history. So automation is not new. So now we have Roomba, we have smart homes, and so on. And we'll have maybe robots at some day, but. Um, machines such as dishwasher or laundry laundry machine or um, automated cooker or something like that, that they already exist so they were at some point also technological innovations and literature has actually documented that um, there is not so much change in in women's work so in women's unpaid labor so machines have not liberated women from unpaid work um, because there, it's so much culturally also embedded. Um, it's not only about technological feasibilities, it's about social structure. Um, so going forward, very similarly, I think just using technology is very difficult to change, um, to change uh, gender dynamics. Um, so I don't want to be very pessimistic here, but um, I'm also not a super optimist <laughs> in that way. Um, it, it really requires um, social changes and probably political activities to change to change that and not just um, technology alone. So I hope that was uh, a answer that was a useful answer. Um, and then we have a question from Matthew Cole. Uh, thank you for this talk. I think this is really important research and look forward to seeing how it develops. However, I'm unclear about how you define work, what counts as work and why. There is a large literature and long debate in feminist political economy over what counts as work versus labor versus generally socially reproductive activity. Despite the explanation it gave for the table, it's not really clear why domestic activity counts as work in the sense of market mediated activity uh, that individuals are compelled to do for wage. And just a detail about task rabbit, the workers who assemble furniture also perfor perform a lot of unpaid labor. How do you square this with your typology? Yeah, thank you, Matthew. I think that's um, a good and also very important question to clarify what is work, what is labor. Um, in our approach, it's quite simple. So we basically derive those categories. Maybe I can show them here again uh, on this bar. So we, we really use the categories that we have derived from time use, re, uh, time use data. And um, so time use data basically captures what we do across 24 hours a day. So that involves uh, going to work, but also involves doing housework. And they are definitions to what counts as housework and what counts as care work. So we basically just use this definition. But I think your question is very good. And um, it's, it's important to, um, to, to define and also understand the differentiations between a work and labor, what it really means. Um, so I'm going to take this as a note, and uh, I will think about that in my paper. Thanks. Um, and then about so task, task rabbit. So yes, they also do unpaid labor. Um, I think uh, okay. so. Um, unpaid labor is really broad, right? And in our project, and also in my paper, we only look at um, unpaid domestic labor. So we don't count, for example, 
Uh, I know there's also literature about uh, gig workers doing unpaid labor, that is, uh, unpaid, there's unpaid time. Um, so this is a, I think, probably it's a different topic, I guess, um, and it's not captured in this, uh, but it's very much worth looking into that. But unfortunately, I can't cover that in my paper, but it's worth highlighting, I think. Um, and then we have something from an anonymous attendee. Um, do you see a future where people have a lot more time, spare time? And if so, who benefits from this? Home entertainment companies, others? Um, yeah, good question. Um, whether we have more spare time, I, I don't know. <laughs> But again, maybe looking back into history, when new machines become available for to do unpaid domestic work, um, I'm not sure whether we actually got more spare time or whether we allocate that time to do maybe more paid work um, or, or other activities. So I think maybe we need to do another forecast exercise in order to find that out. And who benefits from this? Um, home entertainment companies, uh, yes, uh, I, I think that's um, an important question to look into. Um, I think they're the, one of the major group that is pushing um, home automation are tech companies. So large tech, large tech companies, also smaller one, of course. And um, they do that, of course, for profit reason to expand the market, but nowadays also more and more to collect data. So data, data is the new gold, as one say. Um, so yes, uh, tech companies um, can be seen as one of the main, um, main actor groups that benefits from this. Uh, then we have a question from uh, Radoslav Komuda. Um, is self-realization paid work exclusive? What about stay-home moms? I just found a Time article stating women in the US with children under the age of 18. 56% would prefer to stay home over going to work. And 39% of women without children under the age of 18 said they wanted the role of homemaker. Um, yes, for sure, self-realization is not paid work exclusive. And this very much depends on um, the culture. So uh, it, it can very much be um, staying at home. That can be the, the realization. It depends um, on the social structure and it depends on the on culture. So I'm, I'm not saying that um, so for example, uh, gender equality or gender division, this is not uh, just a individual effort. This is very much a societal effort. So um, whether someone wants to stay at home, whether someone wants to work, uh, of course, is there kind of their own will or their own desire to do that, but their own desire is basically shaped by the society, by the culture. So, uh, and this is a US study. I think um, if you conduct the same study in, for example, I don't know, in Scandinavian uh, countries or in Asian countries, um, in other European countries, you probably get different uh, results, uh, which again highlights the um, importance of uh, social and cultural context in order to understand that. Um, and we have another question from Andy. Um, do you think there's a systematic and provable way to modify platforms or technologies to, to escape the problem of social structure? What would an equitable design code look like? Ooh, uh, <laughs> um, whether there's a technology to escape the problem of social structure. Um, I think that's, that's challenging. I think um, uh, people who are very pro, let's say, technology uh, determinism would say yes. Um, but I'm a little bit unsure about that um, because technologies, of course, are uh, developed in the society, right? Um, and the designers of technology, the engineers who design those technology um, are have grown up in societies and they, so basically those people who shape technology are part of the society. So you can't just um, 
look at technology as in a vacuum. So technology is never neutral, as, as we know. Um, the codes are, are never neutral uh, because designers, a society as such, is, is not neutral. So I think it, it's going to be hard. Um, equitable design, I, but I do think, so on the positive side, I do think that a lot of effort that we can observe nowadays um, is very um, positive, I think. So there are activist groups um, who are pushing for equitable redesigns, who they're feminist coders, they are um, uh, coders uh, from that is people of color, and they really push this and want to embed social equity in the code. So in that sense, I think there's a lot of hope. Um, so yes, uh, so basically a kind of yes to your question. Um, then we have another question from, uh, oh, from Katya. So Katya is a PI of the project. Um, would it make sense to have a privacy invasion dimension? Household production is not only expressive uh, expression of love. It also is based on very intimate knowledge of individuals. Yeah, yeah, yes, uh, definitely. Um, I think the uh, dimensions that I listed in the table is a, um, it's not encompassing, I think. Those are the dimensions that I picked to, to argue because I think they are very important. But I think you're right, I think uh, the, um, the intimate knowledge is, of course, also is, of course, very important. Um, and I'm just thinking how that may go into automation. Um, I think a part of what technology companies sells nowadays is this intimate knowledge, right? Because um, so uh, smart products, they collect data from, from the users in order to get this intimate knowledge. So Yes, that's a point that I'm going to note down, and um, I think I will think about this for the paper as well, this intimate knowledge um, dimension. Um, we have 15, for 14 minutes left. I think I will try to go through all the questions. Maybe I'm going to pick from someone uh, that has not raised a question yet, and I'm going to pick Suryana Kata's question. Um, thanks for the presentation. I'm looking forward to reading the paper. I'm curious about the methods and assumptions that underpin the automations course, particularly as the Frey and Osborne methodology has been extensively criticized for being opaque and making subjective problematic assessments about the potential for individual occupations to get automated. Yes, absolutely. Um, so just to make it clear for everyone, uh, the first one, this is a Frey and Osborne paper, and uh, yes, they have been criticized, exactly for um, the reasons that you have mentioned. And the follow-up papers, they, uh, they criticized that, and they changed the methodology for, for in, in their papers. And in our paper, we did not rely on the basics, what they did in labor market study. What we did um, here in our Delphi study is um, we want to contribute to this methodological debate. And that's actually another paper that is currently in preprint where we make exactly that point. Um, so here we want to emphasize that it's maybe problematic to treat experts as a homogenous pool. Um, experts, as we know, are also, they grow up in specific societies, have specific ideologies, pushed by different interests and so on. So what we did is um, we uh, invited respondents from two different countries, so two different contexts, two different markets also, and we also try to have a really balanced um, balanced uh, between male and uh, male and female experts, because we know that female experts or female in general do more labor more, or unpaid labor and probably have different insights and also different experience than, um, than males. So we try to have this balance, but it was tricky because we just have less women working in tech. Um, and the other thing that I touched upon briefly is, is we collected response from academia, R&D, and business 
um, because based on in which field you're working and you probably also have different interests that you want to bring forward and that will influence the forecast that they make. And um, I don't have that slide here, but we do have uh, other figures in this um, other paper, which is in preprint. We do show that there are differences in predictions between male and female experts. There are differences between Japanese and UK experts and also across the fields. So uh, yeah, thanks a lot for that question. Um, there is a question from Philip Riederle. Uh, thanks for your interesting talk. Who did fill out your survey? Could it be the case that these participants did fall for Polanyi's paradox that is much harder to automate non-routine manual task domestic work as, com as commonly expected? Data on job polarization supports that paradox. Um, so uh, yeah, who I, I maybe I partly answer your question here with this pool of experts um, but maybe just to go a bit more into your question um, and who are those experts so what we did is uh, we started with um, experts that we know um, experts that from our own connections here for here uh, so the UK team and also Japanese team um, and then we expanded from there. So on one hand, that's what we did. And on the other hand, we also uh, did web research, this is desk research. So for example, we looked up um, the, let's say the top 100 uh, tech women in 2020. Um, so we went through the list and we contacted, uh, if I remember correctly, over 200 people um or or even more um because it's really difficult those are really busy people some of them are ceos of big companies so it's quite difficult to get to uh, to get to them um but what are their ideologies that's a very good question but unfortunately we can't or we couldn't cover that in the survey so the survey we really try to keep it short since they had to estimate um those many many tasks um so we really just collected the basic demographics that is their age the gender um country and so on um let's see there is um, a, another question from another anonymous attendee. Um, uh, thank you for this talk. May you specify whether the paper has been published and also whether the Delphi will be released in full. I'm a little confused as your time horizon in the talk is 10 years, but the question seems to be to have been formulated for a four year, uh, sorry, five year horizon. Besides, I am interested to better understand the expert landscape. The question that you are addressing is as much as policy one as it is a tech one, even it is more of a policy question. Uh, thanks. Um, okay, so there are a couple of questions nested in this one. Um, paper is not yet published. I'm still working on it. Uh, so the, all those questions are great. So because I can use them to um, finish my paper. Um, and the Delphi is not yet released in full, but it will be. So it will be made open. It will be open data. Uh, everyone can access um, the time horizon. So yes, uh, I think the question was, address to to this one so the question here is formulated in five years we do have another question um the same question just for 10 years uh this is just to showcase um how the questions were formulated but basically the respondents go through the five-year questions and then they do the same for for 10 years so i hope that's clarified um and then the expert landscape uh the question that we're addressing is much more policy. Um, yeah, so that's a good one. Um, we really tried to emphasize, please just think about the technological feasibility for automation. So this is, we had a long or not, we tried to be brief in the introduction before the survey to clarify what we want from the experts. And um, we emphasize that we want to know what do you think, what are the 
uh, technological bottlenecks. So ignore everything else, think about what is technological feasible. Um, but we then noticed that, um, so we have several rounds of the, the survey. So there's an interim round where we ask um, people who gave really extreme answers to justify their answers. And through that more qualitative session, we realized that it's actually quite impossible for even experts to only think about technological feasibility because people were saying, um, well, if we only consider the technological aspect, we forget about price, then pretty much everything can be automated if, we, if you don't consider the price. Um, so it's really difficult um, to, to just think about the technological aspect. So I think to some extent, maybe it's not even possible to entirely think only about that. And the paper, yes, has, um, so the paper exactly wants to emphasize the uh, social, so, sociological, the political, economical aspect of it. Um, and we have, ah, Grant. Grant is my office partner. Um, Grant raises a question. The track record of experts in predicting self-driving cars has been abysmal. Musk has been predicting full self-driving this year, every year since 2017. Yes, Uber was going to have 100,000 self-driving taxis in the road in 2019. Why is this methodology uh, reliable? Well, I think, so Grant, thanks for the question. Um, I think the previous question was actually also touching upon that. And it's exactly not always about the technological feasibility. I mean, I guess self-driving car, it's actually already there, right? And what is the more difficult part is the infrastructure that supports self-driving car. Uh, you probably need to um, have an entire smart city in order to allow that. And that again is coupled with financial questions and so on. So, um, so all those predictions, they uh, we have to take it with a pinch of salt because they all depend on so many different factors, not just technological feasibility. Um, why is this methodology reliable? Well, we want to argue that we have um, a very, it's not a homogenous pool of, um, of experts. So we really try to make it more balanced. Uh, that is taking more than one country, uh, both genders across fields. So I hope that answers your question. Um, we have three minutes left. I might not be able to go over all other questions, um, but let's take uh, Radoslav's question. I'd say 50% of households in UK have a dishwasher. Almost three fourth um, households in Japan don't. Uh, 30,000 respondents, 20 to 69 years. How do we deal with that? Yeah, so the dishwasher, that's a really good one. So uh, yes, many Japanese households don't have dishwashers, whereas in UK, it's quite a common thing. And um, this is something that we actually also have talked in, uh, in the team. And uh, Katya, so the PI over the project, she has a lot of insights into Japanese society. Um, she has studied Japanese society. Um, and we discussed that in the terms of um, it's also it has maybe to do with architecture. So on average, Japanese houses are much smaller than uh, UK houses. So it's not only about, again, technological availability. It's also about how that fits into the available infrastructure. Um, so you can't you have to also always consider the context, be it the social, the cultural or architectural context. Um, Right, so I think, I, I hope that this answered your question. Um, I guess it's too much of a stretch to take in another question in two minutes, right? Yeah, I, yeah, I think so. But thank you, Lulu. That's been a fantastic talk and um, really fascinating stuff there. I think, I guess the last question would be, uh, where can we find out more about your, your work and your research? 
<laughs> yeah, thanks. Um, I guess uh, on the web page, <laughs> the OIL web page at the moment. Uh, so this paper is not published yet, uh, as I said, but when it will be, um, I'm going to put it on the website. We also have a domestic AI website, so you can just check that to be up to date if you're interested. Great. Well, thank you, Lily. Uh, as I say, fantastic talk and a really interesting topic, which will no doubt gain more and more interest in the coming months and years. Um, our forthcoming events are all listed on the OII website. Uh, and in, those of you who've attended today virtually or, or in person will uh, get a chance to watch the full recording back if you missed any of it uh, today. So thank you, everyone, and see you next time. Thank you very much.